Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the PhD ESC Colloquium. Uh, today is my uh, pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Arian Mokhtari. He uh, received his um, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from uh, Sharif University in Iran, 2011. And since 2012, he's been with us pursuing his uh, PhD. He got a master's in, in each way as well. And today, uh, he's going to delight us with his talk on stochastic quasi-Newton methods. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Santi, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to my presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about the stochastic quasi-Newton methods. And uh, this is a joint work with my advisor, Alejandro Ribeiro. So talking about the stochastic quasi-Newton methods, first, I want to talk about the stochastic optimization problem. So what is a stochastic optimization problem? Like any other optimization problem, we want to minimize the objective function, f, as you see in uh, blue color here, where I'm going to call this function average function in the rest of the talk. And uh, w is going to be our optimization variable. So we want to find w star such that it minimizes the f function. But what is important about this function f is that you can write this function as the expected value of a set of random functions. Let's call f in red color uh, instantaneous function, which has two inputs. The first one is the optimization variable w, and the other one is theta, where theta is a random variable chosen from a set capital theta. So the important thing is these red functions are instantaneous functions or random functions because they depend on the random variable theta, and we want to minimize the expectation of them, which we call average function f. So this is the general setting. And we assume that the instantaneous functions are strongly convex, which implies that the average function is also strongly convex. So take a look at one of the applications that this class of problem has. I mean, it has a lot of application in wireless systems, in control, in robotics, and etc. But the one that I want to focus is the, class the classic classification problem that we face in machine learning. We have a set of data points xi, which we know the, data the label of xi is yi. And we want to find the classifier w such that it classifies the sample points with label 1 from the one with label minus 1. So it's not hard to realize this class of problem can be written as the average loss function over all the sample points that we have, plus this regularization term which we have added in order to avoid overfitting the training set. So this is a very classic classification problem in machine learning. But we want to see how this problem is related to the thing that I introduced in the previous slide. So imagine theta, uh, which it was a random variable, where theta i is the pair of xi, yi, which is one sample point with its label, and define instantaneous functions as the loss function of that specific sample point, theta, which corresponds to xi, yi, plus the regularization term. If we assume the, expect the distribution of this random variable theta is uniform over all the sample points that we have, then the expected value of this function can be written as the average of all the loss function plus the regularization term, which is exactly the problem that we want to solve. So we can understand that this class of problem is a, is a specific case of stochastic optimization. So we have assumed the distribution is uniform. This is one thing. The other thing that I've also assumed in this setting is that the number of instantaneous functions that we have is finite, which is not generally the case. For example, in the previous one, you could have infinite number of random functions. So here's one example. But to, un to see how we we're going to solve this problem of stochastic optimization, first think of optim general optimization problem. If you want to minimize a function f, the easiest way and the most naive way is to use gradient descent. So you compute the gradient of objective function which in the rest of the talk I'm going to call it S as the gradient of the average function. And then you descend through the negative value, uh, negative direction of the gradient, right? Uh, which is multiplied by a step size, which is not important here. But the, impo oh, I'm sorry. but the important thing is you have to compute the gradient of the average objective function, which is the expected value of the gradients of all the instantaneous function that you have. But computation of gradient is infeasible. Why? First of all, you may not know the distribution of random variables that you're dealing with. And the second thing is maybe it's not uh, computationally possible to compute that. For example, in the previous slide that I told you, if you want to compute the gradient of this objective function, you have to deal with the gradient of all the data points that you have, which is going to be costly when n, capital N, is very large. 
So the solution for that is using a stochastic gradient instead of gradients. What is the idea of a stochastic gradient is that instead of computing the expected value, you just look at L realization of these sample points that you have, of the random variable that you have, and you compute gradient for that specific point using that set of random sets, and you compute the average of them. This average is going to be a stochastic uh, gradient for the object, for the actual gradient, which means that it's an unbiased estimator for the actual gradient that we want to have here. So we don't have the exact gradient, but we have an unbiased estimator of that. So if you descend through the, uh, the descent direction of a stochastic gradient instead of gradient, you can still converge, but uh, there are so many uh, difficulties with the convergence that I, won't, I don't want to go over the details, but you have to use diminishing step size, and the rate is going to be slow because of a stochastic gradient descent. But that's okay. We know that a stochastic gradient descent is a slow, but there are two reasons for being a slow. The first one is we are using a stochastic gradient, which we cannot solve it. This is the thing that we have to deal with that because it's infeasible to compute the gradient. But the second reason is because even gradient method is slow. The reason that it is slow is that you don't use the curvature information of the objective function to descend through the correct direction. That's a problem, especially in the case that the problem is ill-conditioned. The convergence rate is going to be very slow. So the natural solution for solving this issue in, in a deterministic setting is using Newton method. But the problem with Newton method is you have to compute the Hessian and the Hessian inverse, which is not, may not be available in so many applications, or it's going to be computationally costly to compute. So the idea that they use in deterministic setting to resolve this issue is quasi-Newton method. And to understand the idea of quasi-Newton method, let me explain the, uh, the update of uh, quasi-Newton method. Here you can see it's different from the update of gradient descent that I have here by pre-multiplying the gradient direction by a matrix, which we call it approximation for the Hessian of objective function. If you put the exact Hessian here, then you're going to have the update rule of Newton method, right? But if you put this approximation matrix, we try to define a matrix P, which is close enough to the Hessian, but we, can, we don't have access to the actual Hessian. So it's, like, it's going to be an approximation for that. There are different techniques for approximating the Hessian of objective function, as all of them are coordinator methods. The first one is Broglie method, DFV, BFGS. But the one that has the best performance in deterministic setting, at least, is BFGS. To understand what is, uh, how we update this matrix B in BFGS method, first I want to introduce these two vectors to you. Variable variation, which is the difference of two consecutive iterates that we have, WT plus 1 and WT, and gradient variation, which is the difference of two consecutive gradients evaluated at time t plus 1 and time t. So what we want to make sure that is this matrix, which, is gonna use as the, which we're going to use as the approximation of the Hessian, satisfies the second condition. What is second condition? It's saying that the Hessian approximation times variable variation, variable variation is going to be equal to gradient variation. The important thing about this condition is we know the actual Hessian satisfies this condition when WT is close enough to WT plus 1. So since we know this condition is satisfied with the Hessian, we want to make sure that the Hessian approximation that we are having also satisfies the same condition. But of course, there is not a unique solution for this system of equations. So to have a unique solution at each iteration, we add uh, another criteria to the Hessian approximation matrix that we want to use. The thing is we want to make sure, okay, first of all, we want to make sure that Bt plus 1 satisfies the second condition. But at the same time, we know that the Hessian at time t is not that different from the Hessian at time t plus 1, right? So this leads to the idea that we want to make sure that Bt plus 1 is also close to Bt. So to, to measure this closeness, we use uh, differential entropy. What I mean by differential entropy means that I want to make sure that the approximation matrix at time t plus 1, which I call here z, is close to bt, which uh, this term measures the difference between z and bt in terms of differential entropy. I want to minimize the difference between these two. So I want to make sure that bt plus 1 is close enough to bt. And at the same time, I want to make sure that it satisfies the second condition. Right? This semi-definite program has a nice closed form solution, which is this one. What it has is saying that the Hessian approximation at time t plus 1 is a function of the previous one and the gradient and variable variation that we had at time t. Yes? So I didn't see, what is second condition? Second condition is this condition that we have here. So, which is the condition that the Hessian satisfies when wt is close to wt plus 1. Okay? 
So it has been shown that BFGS improves the convergence of gradient descent. And uh, the, the, the more important thing that I want to emphasize here is this. If you pick the initial Hessian approximation matrix positive definite, and you can guarantee that this inner product that we have here is positive, then you can show that this matrix is going to stay positive definite for the all the iterations. And this condition is satisfied when, satisfied when your objective function is a strongly convex. So that's the reason that we need a strong convexity for this algorithm. OK, so this is BFGS. We want to make it stochastic. What we did wa with gradient descent was that replacing all the gradients with the stochastic gradients to define a stochastic gradient descent. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to re replace all the gradients with the stochastic gradients. What happens is we are going to use a stochastic gradient in the, descent, in the uh, update for the descent direction and also in the uh, gradients that we are using for modifying the gradient variation. But here is the difference. First of all, th this is the most important thing that I want to emphasize in this slide. The stochastic gradient that we are using for defining a stochastic gradient variation is not wt plus 1 theta t plus 1. Because we want, because we want to approximate the objective function curvature uh, corresponding to the set theta t. If I use two different sets of random variables, right, they're going to correspond to two different instantaneous sets of instantaneous functions, right? So in order to, to approximate the curvature of objective function, you have to use the same set of random variables to compute the stochastic gradient variation. Because this is the one that you're going to use to approximate the curvature of function. If you want to approximate the curvature of function theta t, you have to use the same gradient that corresponds to the same set of random variables. OK. So here is the difference between the pre this one and the BFGS, and also this is stochastic gradient here. Of course, because we are doing the same thing, uh, the update rule is going to be the same. The only difference is instead of a stochastic gradient variation, instead of gradient variation, we have a stochastic <coughs> gradient variation. But the problem is this. If you do this simple modification, the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix can be arbitrarily close to 0, which leads to the very large eigenvalue for BT inverse. This is not a problem in BFGS because when in BFGS, when the gradient is 0, this only happens when the gradient is 0. OK, when the gradient is 0, you are converged, right? In the deterministic setting. But here, if a stochastic gradient is 0, it doesn't guarantee that you are converged. So that's the thing that happens. When you're close to the optimal solution, the stochastic gradient may be 0, but the gradient is not 0. And then you have this issue that the maximum eigenvalue becomes very large and the algorithm diverges. To resolve this issue, we go back to the deterministic setting and try to think how we can resolve this issue first in the deterministic setting. So what was the conditions that BFGS matrix satisfied? First one was the second condition. The second one was the proximity criteria. Which one was, was more important? Obviously, the <coughs> second condition, because that's the one that the Hessian satisfied. And the other one, we just added to make sure that we have a unique solution per iteration. Right? So we are going to. We are going to modify that condition in a way that we are looking for a matrices that satisfy second condition. They are close to BT inverse, but at the same time, they are positive definite. The minimum eigenvalue is bounded from zero. Yeah, the, all the eigenvalues are larger than theta, uh, delta, sorry, larger than delta. This is a modification that we add to this uh, optimization problem that we solve for computing BT plus one, right? It's not clear that it's going to have a nice closed form solution, but fortunately, we have a nice closed form solution for this. And it's different from the previous one by adding this delta i, but this is not the only modification. Because if you just add delta i, then it's not going to satisfy the second condition. The other difference is this gradient variation is substituted by modified gradient variation, which is the previous gradient variation minus delta vt. So this is going to give you. Uh, this is going to give you a matrix which is going to satisfy second condition. It's going to be positive definite with the minimum eigenvalue equals delta or larger. And it's also close to Bt. So, okay, now we have the condition that we are looking for. So if we substitute all the gradients, with the stochastic gradients, we can develop a stochastic version of this algorithm. This one is regularized BFGS. Of course, the next one is going to be regularized the stochastic BFGS, which I'm going to call it REST in the rest of the presentation. So the same optimization problem, the difference is I'm going to replace the gradient variation with the stochastic gradient variation. Same update rule, but the modified stochastic gradient variation is going to be a stochastic gradient variation minus delta vt, right? So the same idea that we had before. 
this guarantees that the minimum eigenvalue of Vt is larger than zero, which means the maximum eigenvalue of Vt inverse is bounded, uh, is bounded above. So, but here, as you can see, I've added gamma i into the descent direction here uh, into the Hessian approximation matrix Vt inverse because I want to make sure that the minimum eigenvalue is not also zero. It's not a big deal, even if it's zero, that's not a problem because you're not gonna descend in one iteration, but in the next iteration you, you're gonna descend because you're changing a stochastic gradient. But just in order to avoid this situation, I'm adding this gamma i, which is just added for the analysis of the algorithm. But in terms of practical issue, it's not gonna be a problem. So by adding this, uh, I can say, okay, we can formalize rest here. We can summarize the steps of rest here. Uh, we start with a, a Hessian approximation matrix, which the minimum eigenvalue is strictly uh, uh, larger than delta here. And then you, you grab like L realization of the random variable that you have. You compute a stochastic gradient as this, and you update your variable using the descent direction of rest. You use the same set of random variables to compute this stochastic gradient, and the difference of these two are gonna use as to build the modified stochastic gradient variation here. And of course, the variable variation is gonna be the difference between WT plus one and WT. Then we update the Hessian approximation matrix here to use in the next iteration, okay? So uh, to go to the analysis of the algorithm, first I want to clarify what are the, ass the assumptions that we have used in the proofs. Uh, we assume that the eigenvalues of the instantaneous Hessians are bounded. This lower bound means we assume strong convexity. The upper bound means that we assume that the gradients of instantaneous Hessians are, uh, the gradients of the, uh, the instantaneous functions are Lipschitz continuous. And which are the typical assumptions that we use here for showing the convergence. And here, we assume that the second moment of the norm of a stochastic gradient is bounded. This is also a very uh, typical assumption in stochastic optimization because you want to make sure that the variance of a stochastic gradient is bounded. Okay, the thing that we have added to the assumption is that we want to make sure that the delta, notice that we pick delta, right? We want to make sure that delta is strictly smaller than the strong convexity constant. Right? To guarantee that this inner product stays positive. Okay, assuming this assumption with typical uh, sets, uh, choices of uh, step sizes, which are non-summable but square summable, we can show that the sequence of iterates generated by BFGS, by REST, sorry, by REST, they're gonna converge to the optimal solution almost surely or with probability one. Moreover, if you pick this specific set of, uh, in the specific form of a step size, which is in the order of one over t, you can show that the convergence in the expectation is at least in the order of one over t. Okay, so let's go to the one, the one simple application for the rest that I just proposed. Let's assume, the, uh, let's assume a simple quadratic programming. We assume that A is a diagonal and positive definite matrix where diagonal components are chosen from this set, one to the 10 minus zeta, okay? For example, if zeta is two, it's from 1.1 1 .1 and 10 to the minus two, right? And we assume that B is a uniformly, uh, uniformly chosen from the box zero to one to the power of n, and the random variable theta is uniformly chosen from this set. And the, okay, this is the optimization problem that I want to solve. This is the typical quadratic problem, but here's the important thing. This part in blue, the expected value of this part is gonna be zero. Why? Because we assume that the expected value of theta is zero. So each di diagonal component of this matrix, they have expected value of zero. So if you compute the expectation, it's gonna give you the classic quadratic program, this term plus this term, right? So we know the optimal solution of this problem, we just want to see, okay, if you don't know, if you have this observation, how can we find the optimal solution of this objective function? Okay? The important thing about this setting is that by picking the, uh, the components of A from this set, I can show that the condition number of the problem is 10 to the zeta. Sorry. Uh, sure. Being from A and B, you pick it randomly once. That's not part of your no, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh. Th these are given, and okay. this is the random variable. Yeah, you're right. These are not random variables, but these are no, the no, beta. No, no, okay. Sure. okay, sure. In the experiments, I'm gonna assume n is 50, which is the dimension of the decision variable, w. 
or dimension of A as well, and theta zero is half. So we're gonna set L equals five, L is the size of mini batch that we are using for computing with stochastic gradient. For REST, the best option is five. For SGD, the best option is one. And these are the uh, regularization parameters that I've used for REST. And for both of them, we use the best diminishing step sizes. The important thing is notice that for SGD, I'm using L equals one. So per iteration, I use only one instantaneous function. For the other one, I use five. So it's not a fair comparison if I compare them in terms of iterations. So I'm gonna compare them in terms of number of stochastic functions processed, which is LT. So as you can see, I run these algorithms and wait until the time that they reach this accuracy. As you can see, the, the, here is the empiric, empirical distribution of number of stochastic functions that you need to reach this accuracy. For the case that the condition number is small, like 10, you see the difference is not huge, but there is a difference between them. Like REST on average needs like 120 iteration, 120 instantaneous functions to converge to this accuracy, while SGD needs 400. But when you increase the condition number, which is the main idea of REST was to deal with ill condition problem, <coughs> you can see the average number that you need is around like 400, while for SGD is like into the order of 10,000. So the difference is significant in this case. This, uh, this part is also very important. I want to explain why this regularization is very important. I'm just showing you one illustration of a stochastic BFGS, which is the one without regularization, rest, and a stochastic gradient descent. I'm using constant step size to make sure that the noise of a stochasticity is not diminishing uh, by using the diminishing step sizes. So here you can see risk converges and then go back, goes around the optimal solution, which is the natural thing that you expect to see. SGD converges to the optimal solution, but very slowly. And the one without regularization gets close to the convergence, but it diverge because of the issue that I told you about the small eigenvalue of BT. So uh, this shows the idea, why the idea of regularization is important. Okay, so far I have talked about risk. But let's summarize what we have so far. SGD is, has low computational cost, is on, it's in order of N and low storage because you have to only to keep track of WT. But the issue is it's gonna have a slow convergence, right? About SBFGS, it will diverge, that's a problem. And about RES, it has fast convergence, but the issue with that is you have to compute the Hessian inverse at each iteration, right? If you have to compute the inverse of a matrix per iteration, the cost of computation is gonna be in the order of NQ. The I'm sorry. The other issue is you have to keep track of the Hessian approximation at the previous uh, iteration to update your current one, right? So you have to store BT, which requires a storage of order N square. So this is gonna be a problem in large scale problems. So we resolve this issue by using the idea of all BFGS or online limited memory BFGS. To, in, to reduce the computation cost and the storage cost of REST. Let's see what is the idea of LBFGS first. Uh, this is the update rule of BFGS without any limited memory version. This is just BFGS, but the update for the inverses of them, not for the B. You, you can see this is the relation between BT inverse and BT minus one inverse. Here is the general update that we have. The computation complexity of this is in the order of N square, which is still better than NQ but the storage is still n square. But the point is, I want to explain how we can, why this is not an efficient when, uh, way of updating the Hessian approximation. This is update of BFGS. Look at BT inverse. It's a function of BT minus one inverse and the curvature information pairs from the previous iterate, right? But if you think this one is also a function of BT minus two inverse and V2 minus two RT minus two. If you think this way, you can realize BT inverse is a function of the initial one and all the pairs of curvature information that you have observed so far. So you're using a lot of information from past to approximate the current Hessian, right? But we expect to see that the current Hessian is more or less related to the, what I have observed recently, not all the things that I've observed so far, right? For that reason, the idea of limited memory BFGS comes. Uh, the idea is only use the last tau sets of curvature information that you have observed so far, instead of using all of them that you have observed so far. So pick a, the, the update is like this. You pick an, an initial uh, approximation 
bt0 inverse, right? And you update it using the oldest one first. If you put u equals 0, you use the oldest gradient variation and variable variation to get this one. And then uh, you do this process for tau iterations, which will give you the Hessian approximation at time t. So at each iteration, you start with the initial matrix, and you use these tau sets of information to, uh, to compute your uh, Hessian approximation at time t, Hessian inverse approximation at time t, right? The important thing about LBFGS is the, co the computational cost of this setting is in the order of tau n instead of n square. And you don't have to store the previous matrix. You just store these pairs. So therefore, the, the, the storage is going to be in the, order, in the order of tau n instead of n square. Right? This is the idea of LBFGS. OLBFGS uses um, just substitute all the gradients with the stochastic gradients. As you can see, you have variable variation and stochastic gradient variation instead of uh, the original gradient variation. You, you do the same process. You start with an initial approximation per iteration. You d do this recursive process for tau iterations using the, this sets that you have. And then you get the Hessian approximation at time t. You descend over this direction, and you update your variable wt, wt to get wt plus 1. But this is very important. I guess you have noticed that neither here nor here I haven't used the regularization. So this algorithm, the old BFGS, doesn't require using any kind of regularization. We're going to see in the next slide why this is the case. Because we can show that the trace of Hessian approximation matrix is upper bounded by a constant. The determinant of this matrix is also lower bounded by a constant. So the sum of eigenvalues are upper bound, is upper bounded. The product of eigenvalues is lower bounded. So you can say each eigenvalue is in a specific interval, right? You can have a lower bound and upper bound for the eigenvalues of this matrix. As a result, you have lower and upper bounds for the eigenvalues of Pt inverse, right? This is the reason that you don't need this regularization for all BFGS. Of course, because we have the same situation here, uh, using the same step size, we can prove the same result, which is almost short convergence uh, to, the actual, to the optimal solution. And if you use diminishing the step size, we're going to have 1 over t convergence in expectation. So uh, here's the thing. Now let's go to the, uh, the first problem that I told you as an application, which is the classification problem. Here in this setting, I've just substituted the loss function with the hi squared hinge loss, uh, which we call this problem support vector machines. And uh, here I'm using a synthetic data set. I assume that I have n sample points. Half of them are with label 1, half of them are with label minus 1. And the ones that, that have label 1 are chosen, each component of them, each component of the features, are chosen from this interval, uniformly at random. And for the one that have label minus 1, the, the components of feature vectors are chosen from this. This setting leads to the case that the data set is not linearly separable. You, you can see there is, like a, uh, there is like a common area between these two intervals. So here you can see uh, the advantage of all, uh, we're going to see the performance of all BFGS with respect to REST and SGD. What I have done is this. I have run these algorithms for, after running four, 40,000 feature vectors, which is almost four passes over the data set, when the dimension of problem is 1,000. And here is the empirical distribution of objective function value. As you can see, uh, the mean value of objective function for uh, for all VFGS is around 10 to 10 times to the 10 to the minus 6, while for REST it's almost the same. It's 9.5 times 10 to the minus 6, while for SGD it's very large <coughs> and it's like uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 2. So as you can see, the performance of all VFGS is not that different from REST in terms of number of process feature vectors, right? But they both have perform SGD. But we know this is not the problem of REST. The problem is computationally it's going to be expensive to implement this algorithm. Here, I fix the objective function value to the 10 to the minus 4, and I look at the distribution of time that I need to reach to this accuracy. For all BF, for, SG, uh, for rest, let's start with rest. You need almost seven, seven seconds, more or less, actually more than seven seconds. For SGD, you need two seconds, but for all BFGs, you need 0.1 seconds to get to this accuracy. 
So it shows that in terms of convergence time, th in this case, rest is worse than SGD, but all VFGs outperform both of them. Okay. So here we are using, uh, we are dealing with a uh, uh, real dataset application, a click-through rate application, which is uh, based on a, a search engine data set that we have used. Uh, the number of sample points that we have is around 200 million, and we have designed the feature vectors, which is the size of feature vector, the dimension of feature vectors that we have is around 50 million. The way that we have uh, int produced the feature vectors is this, like, you, you know, like, each person clicking ad or not, right? But the point is, what are the features about that specific ad, the advertisement, the advertiser, the person who click or not, the person, what were the queries that the guy has done so far? So we, we encode all these information into a vector to generate feature <coughs> vectors. For example, the gender of the guy who has issued the, the query. For example, if he's male, the code is going to be 100. Zero, zero. If, if she's female, it's going to be 010. Zero, zero. And if you don't know the uh, sex of the person, it's going to be zero, zero, 001. So this way, we encode the feature vectors. And the size of feature vector is going to be around 56 million. But the important thing is, since we are using binary encoding, the, the feature vectors are very sparse. Like the max number of non-zero components that you see in a feature vector is around 100. And on average, it's around 59. This helps to implement this algorithm in a, this uh, feature vectors using the, to use REST and all VHS for running uh, for classifying this data set because uh, the feature vectors are sparse, so it's easier to compute the gradients and this gradient uh, the Hessian approximation. So let's move on to the result that we have. Uh, here I just compare all VFGs and SGD. Of course, I don't compare REST because it's going to take a long time to implement that for this larger scale application. But as you can see, the objective function value for all VHGs is significantly better than SGD. And also, the prediction error is better for all VHGs with respect to SGD. This is in terms of number of process feature vectors or number of instantaneous functions that we have used. And if we compare them in terms of uh, runtime, we would see this almost a similar uh, plots because the runtime of all VFGs is not that different from SGD. It's just a constant. Uh, the difference is in a constant. So you can see we have the same result for the convergence time of these algorithms. All VFGs uh, converges faster, and the prediction error is smaller after only. The important thing is we have only, uh, in, for example, here you can see we have run, we have only used. 40, 000, uh, I'm sorry, 40 million feature vectors, which is not even one pass over the data set. Yes, and this is the plot in terms of runtime. And I guess I have to conclude. So to conclude, uh, I have to say that we propose RES as a stochastic quasi Newton method. That the important thing is it keeps the second condition as in OBFGS. It modifies the proximity, the proximity criteria in order to make sure that the eigenvalues are bounded as well as we want to make sure that the, we have almost sure convergence and it outperforms SGD in terms of numerical experiments. But we know that REST is, uh, requires a lot of computation costs, so we, uh, we considered all BFGS as a stochastic extension of LBFGS. We showed that the computation complexity of all BFGS, uh, it, has the, it reduces the computation comp complexity of all BFGS while it has the same bounds that we need for the eigenvalues of the Asian approximation. Almost sure convergence is proved, and uh, the sublinear convergence in expectation is also proven in the paper. And the last thing is, uh, we can see that all VFGS outperforms SGD in terms of both convergence time and uh, convergence rate. Yes, thanks for your time and uh, your attention. Yes, yes. The trick is, if you look at these constants, you can understand this. Yeah, I yeah. got the idea, like, if you have tau is changed to infinity, then this will be lower. There you go. Like, you cannot use the same technique to show that this, uh, this is going to happen. Like, uh, if you want to go with res, you cannot use this upper bound or lower bound. For, for OBFGS, you cannot show any lower bound or upper bound for the trace or for the determinant, as well as for the uh, eigenvalues of the matrix. But for this case, we can have this lower upper bound and lower bound, which leads to, to these bounds that we have here. 
as you correctly said, this tau is going to be very large, then you cannot prove the same thing. And this is actually very interesting that you, we see the same thing in practice, right? You think, okay, maybe this is not the case in practice because this is just one bound. Maybe there is another bound for it. But that's what we have also observed in practice. Okay, and, and uh, what is the impact of tau in the, in the computation? That's a very good question. It's, uh, it depends on the, how different the instantaneous functions from each other, right? If they are very different from each other, you need, uh, of course, larger tau to make sure that you have enough information. But if they are closer to each other, you, need, you may need, like in practice, I just use tau equal 10. But you, there could be cases that tau can be larger or smaller. Uh, no, it's with respect to the sets of random variables you have observed from time zero to time t. So with respect to all the random variables that you have seen so far, yes. So the sigma algebra is the sets of random variables w uh, theta t that you have observed from time zero to time t. Yes, this expectation is with respect to that. No, we don't know the probability distribution. The probability distribution of theta, but you don't know that, right? Yes. Yes, but that's the probability of theta, right? Right. 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 So it doesn't change. Right. So why do we care about? Uh, at each iteration, we change it. Actually, I don't know if I emphasize that, but. Per iteration, you change the set of random variables. Like, at the beginning of each iteration, you grab L realization and you use that to compute the stochastic gradients. So they are different per iter for each iteration, right? So each time a new theta is drawn. Using that. As new sets of theta, yeah. Because you need L realization, right? L could be one, but it can be more than one. Okay, that's a good question. But when you show almost, show, I think I didn't try to. You are saying what happened? What is the worst case scenario of this set, right? Is this the correct question? Did I understand your question correctly? Or if you can. Uh, what do you mean by worst theta? I don't understand that. You have a random va you have a random variable, right? You grab these random variables. What do you mean by worst random variable? Like, you can say what is the worst case scenario of convergence. I understand that, but when you show almost sure convergence, which means with probability one, you can this is the best that you can prove, or you converge in. You cannot show that deterministically you converge to that, right? Right. So you can replace uh, the expectation with, for example, a max over theta. Okay, okay, a max over theta. Yeah, with, with this idea where then, I guess, this is the question. Did I understand it correctly? Okay, if that's a question, I didn't consider that. But I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know, to be honest. But I guess the almost sure convergence, yeah, maybe it's not necessary. It's not enough to show that. Yeah, yeah sorry, I don't know that. That's true. That's they, there are some assumptions. You need some assumption to change. That's true. I didn't mention that just for simplicity of the talk. You're right. Okay. Okay. That's if it. No more questions. Thank you, Arian, very much. Thank you, Shri.